Hello and welcome to the Skift India Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Doma Bhutia. And in today's episode, I have with me Vishal Suri, the Managing Director of SOTC Travel. Welcome, Vishal. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me in your show. And I'm really looking forward to this interaction. So are we, Vishal. Um, Today, Vishal and I will be discussing about everything from the evolving visa regulations for Indian travelers to the travel trends in India and beyond. Um, So uh, we'll just get started. First up, Vishal, uh, let's talk about the recent changes in visa regulations that are going to make it easier for Indian travelers to explore Europe. Of course, the new uh, Schengen visa cascade regime looks to offer uh, longer-term multi-entry Schengen visas based on uh, an applicant's travel history. Uh, you know, now someone who wants to know how long is the longer duration, well, according to the European Commission, they've said that they can issue, Schengen countries can issue about a two-year multiple-entry visa after a traveler has used two visas uh, in the previous three years which also means that they want travelers who have a positive travel uh, travel history. Vishal, how do you look at this change? So, like you very rightly put across, Peden, European Union is obviously looking at the attractiveness of the India as a source market, and obviously Indians are traveling quite a bit. So, what they want to do is essentially uh, do three things in my mind. One is they want to target the frequent Indian traveler who has the propensity and the uh, appetite to actually travel multiple number of times to the European Union, which is obviously the Schengen countries. They also want to uh, encourage the spontaneous and the frequent travel uh, to Schengen. Uh, And obviously, uh, their other benefit to them is it will reduce over a period of time the workload on the Schengen, uh, Schengen consular teams uh, in India. Because at this point in time, mm-hmm. obviously, there are delays in appointments and stuff like that. Yeah, because they are already overburdened, right? Yeah, they are already overburdened. And there is a delay in appointments in some of the Schengen uh, countries. Because post-COVID, a lot of them have reduced their consular staff in India. Uh, so what really happens under the casket scheme is that if you've, like you said, uh, if you've traveled to Schengen, twice over the last three years, uh, they will give you, uh, the next time that you apply, a longer term, a two-year visa to start with. And if you use that two-year visa, then you will become eligible for another five-year visa uh, provided your uh, passport is valid at that point in time. Now, you must... Yes, because... Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I wanted to discuss something. You know, it's it's quite funny because, uh, you know, I I am traveling to Europe next month and I applied for and I had before this, I've had like uh, the two year Schengen visa as well as the five year Schengen visa. So the last one that expired was the five year Schengen visa that expired in uh, September 2023. Now, before that, I had done in May 2023 uh, an Iceland and a Finland tour. So when I applied this time from the Norway embassy, um, I applied for, um, you know, I applied for my Schengen visa. So uh, I was I was I was asking the VFS person who was there. I was asking her and she said that, yeah, you may be granted, uh, you know, uh, maybe at least a one year visa you would be granted. And when the visa came back from the Norway embassy, I got a visa for the specific number of days that I am in uh, Scandinavia. And it was a single entry visa. I don't think ever since I've been traveling, I mean, like uh, the past, you know, 10, 15 years, I've ever got a single entry visa. So I was a little taken aback by, you know, I was like, what is happening here? So, uh, so by default today, uh, I'm not very surprised with whatever you just mentioned because by uh-huh. default today, what really happens is, and obviously Schengen, uh, the rule says that you need to apply at the port of entry. So the country which is the port of entry, or where you uh-huh. plan to spend the maximum number of days, maximum number uh, of days, number Correct. of days. So you you have to apply in that particular Schengen. So by default today. If there is no specific request, by default, they will look at your itinerary, they'll look at your insurance, and they'll look at your return tickets. 
and base that by default and i'm using the word by default they typically are uh, oh, will grant okay. you a visa based on the days that you will travel unless you very specifically mention in your application that there is a long term visa under the cascade scheme what really happens is they are changing this default to say that you will be able to apply for a longer term multiple entry visa provided you've traveled to the schengen twice over the last 3 years and if you do that the default can be then you uh, automatically qualify as a frequent traveler and then you can apply for a longer term visa uh, the first uh, longer term visa by default would be a 2 year visa and the subsequent one would be a 5 year visa so that's essentially what it is and like i said earlier when i was trying to basically address your point i personally view this as a very welcome change uh, is going to uh, ease up a lot of backlog because frequent travelers will continue to keep applying if because they travel frequently now with this if they have a longer term visa it will encourage them to travel more frequently and more spontaneously mm -hmm. good for the uh, our industry correct absolutely uh, and visa obviously you will appreciate is a barrier to travel to that extent and once that barrier uh, is to that extent eased and we have noticed there are destinations there are countries like united states of america by default if you are granted an h1 or an h b1 uh, uh, or a b2 sorry you will get a 10 year multiple entry visa canada would Correct. obviously give a mul uh, long term multiple entry visa see both these destinations should have a different kind of a problem because appointments are late but what happens is on an average if you give about a million plus multiple entry visa you have those many people who have an opportunity to travel over the next 10 years and they don't have to keep coming for the next 10 years back to your consulate to apply for another visa so there are countries uh -huh. which are already uh, applying that rule which is uh, us canada uk and they are granting long term visa and now even there are countries like australia also which have started doing it schengen is another welcome one because europe uh, which is the continental europe or the western europe is extremely popular as a travel destination for indians and there are a lot of people who also do businesses uh, uh, with those countries so we view this as a very very positive development for our industry and we are looking forward to the uh, fallout out of this uh, in terms of the uh, bookings and frequent travel which will happen vishal has it been already been implemented or is there a date that they are going to implement this i think they've already announced it and uh, mm -hmm. the dates a specific date because the all all the uh, schengen countries or the union has to come together and start processing it my sense is it will happen mm -hmm. very very quickly in another week or 10 days time it should be ready to be implemented because it's already been announced correct and it is also peak uh, summer travel season for india as well right and uh, you know now shifting our focus to summer travel trends in india you know i wanted to ask you about uh, you know what are indians up uh, up to this season of course um, you know there has been we've been reading a lot about the mix of domestic and international preferences and uh, i also wanted to ask you what are some of the popular domestic destinations is it still the you know usual hill stations goa that continue to attract travelers within india and uh, you know also internationally what are the hot spots for uh, indian tourists uh, you know are indians still traveling to popular destinations both within and outside the country or are they looking to explore you know what are often now called uh, hidden gems see uh, i think uh, my answer would essentially and it's a simple answer is all the above because over the last couple of years and especially post pandemic uh, there is a, a very clear behavioral change and in the way uh, the indians look at travel and there was a time maybe about 10 years back uh, uh, a travel or a leisure travel used to be considered as uh, let's say people used to uh, feel uh, guilty about taking a trip like that or taking long term holidays and traveling and spending so much of their savings into uh, that kind of travel but today uh the behavior has changed and obviously there are changes in the patterns in which people look at so they it's becoming india is becoming more a, a spending economy versus a saving economy saving and people are investing and they realize that uh, they must invest in travel and experiences rather than accumulating uh, material uh, goods and stuff like that so 
people are traveling over the last two years and in any case uh, we've maintained that we've seen a strong uh, surge and of uh, of demand the desire to travel is extremely strong out of india so be it domestic travel or the short haul travel or for that matter a long haul travel everything is uh, is is in demand at this point in time and obviously it's reflected in terms of the higher afs the flights are all full in terms of the higher mm-hmm. uh, hotel accommodation but that doesn't stop uh, coming to your specific questions uh, on the domestic so f- let me first address domestic and then i'll come to the international and international is being driven uh, by completely different set of levers while domestic is a different uh, kind of the levers that uh, uh, see i've always said uh, in the past also and i'm maybe at the cost of repetition Uh, proximity and connectivity essentially drive uh, tourism india in any case was a uh, is a large country it's almost like a continent with uh, 30 plus states uh, different regions different languages different cultures different colors and smells of the country so there's a lot to explore within india but what has happened is over the last one decade under this whole udan scheme uh, we've kind of doubled the number of airports in the country i think the number at this point in time is close to about 150 i think 148 or 149 airports is what we have in the country and over the next 5 years i think this number will go to about 200 which means the country is getting far better connected and when it is better connected and there is a huge thrust right from the uh, the prime minister's office on discover your own country dekho apna desh uh, and mm-hmm. the big viewers uh, and with what happened last year in terms of g20 where we showcase 60 uh, tourism uh, or the centers in india so there is a overall uh, travel and what is also happening people uh, the indian consumer or the indian traveler who was taking about two or three trips in a year is now taking and i'm i may be risking it because i i'm not backing it with a lot of research but whatever i'm seeing around mm-hmm. myself and i'm calling it out in that manner they're taking up to about 5 to 6 trips in a year and a lot of those almost about 4 or 5 of those trips and there could be multiple reasons it could be family reunions it could be friends going out together it could be school reunions or college reunions but people are traveling for leisure uh about 5 to 6 times a year and which is why domestic is surging now summer travel predominantly is the holiday period in schools and colleges so it is more associated with the family travels the family with children and uh, the grand uh, grandparents everybody travels together and summer because it's summer uh, what are the most popular destinations in india is essentially the hills of north the hills of northeast mm-hmm. and obviously the nilgiris the hills of south so obviously hill mm-hmm. destinations are obviously extremely popular in the summer so kashmir le ladakh uttarakhand himachal pradesh northeast whole of northeast is now open for indians to travel are extremely popular at this time while uh, goa is an all year favorite so people travel to goa for 12 months in the year so we are still seeing a lot of this thing uh another reason which is also driving uh domestic travel in india is the uh, resurgence of the spiritual travel and i'm i'm saying this these vaishno devi or the shirdi trips or for that matter uh were always very popular in india but they were they were not being offered like organized programs by organized players such as ours but now what is happening is suddenly there is a very strong surge with the ram mandir the prime minister visiting dwarka uh, so we've kind of expanded players like us have expanded our portfolio and we call it the whole portfolio is called darshans which is essentially spiritual tourism uh, which is where we give uh, aerial darshan by helicopter to adi kailash uh, dev bhumi char dham do dham Darshan means darshans means uh, more of a glimpse, right? It means a glimpse of something. So it's, it's, it's when you yeah. It's it's a very popular uh, way of saying it that if I go to a temple, मेरे दर्शन हुए कि नहीं. You know, I'm. Yeah, it's like pilgrimage. It's more like a pilgrimage. I do the darshan of of the. So darshans is essentially the portfolio that we have curated. 
where which is essentially about spiritual tourism and that and i was talking about kashi vishwanath corridor the vaishno devi the ram temple in ayodhya and obviously what happens is demand is already there the infrastructure in terms of the hotels in terms of the tourism infrastructure is getting built very very quickly because there are private players who are willing to invest around this big opportunity so that's the other reason so uh, at this point in time in domestic obviously like i said the hills of north the hills of south and the northeast are extremely popular uh, we also seeing demand around because it's, it's a holiday period all the pilgrimage or the spiritual destinations are overflowing with tourists and they are going mm -hmm. uh, for this and they are also bundling their leisure trips around that so like if somebody is traveling to north uh, they will do rishikesh white uh, uh, river uh, rafting and stuff like that all of those uh, things they are doing uh, coming to short haul destination in summer i think uh, there is a race amongst countries to actually make uh, travel for indians uh, far far more simpler so there are countries like Absolutely. thailand malaysia uh, and sri lanka to that extent and uh, who made it visa free and obviously it's reduction in cost but visa is obviously a barrier like i mentioned earlier and suddenly mm -hmm. it attracts a lot of pe uh, people and i just want to mention this to you as far as india is concerned uh, indians can now travel to about and nobody knows nobody talks about it we talk about only the popular destination there are about 33 countries uh, which are visa free for indians there are 29 countries which actually give visa on arrival to indians yeah. and there are another 33 countries which give uh, e visa to indians so i'm talking about close to about 80 90 destinations are available uh, to indians to actually travel quite seamlessly uh, in the sense it's the ease is there so uh, india is a, a very attractive source market for all mm -hmm. of the destinations so from a short haul standpoint UAE obviously because of the summer it's it's hot it's going to be hot but Vietnam Bali he's seeing about about 25 percent growth over last year uh, then there is there are these CIS countries like Azerbaijan yes. Georgia Kazakhstan Kazakhstan Sri Lanka Indonesia uh, Singapore Abu Dhabi so you know all of these places are at this point in time. Uh, uh, a lot in demand at this point and so short haul travel is really really booming because there is much better connectivity out of north india there is much better connectivity we are doing a charter program from bengaluru to paro in bhutan and in fact our uh, program is fully sold out and we have now added additional charters from bangalore so it's all in april and may is what it is so suddenly new source markets are being tapped by players like us to see because we were seeing demand coming out of south india and there was no connectivity which was available so we facilitated that and we are obviously reaping some benefits of that at this point in time so that's what we are seeing uh, coming to long haul in summer europe is mm -hmm. by far the most popular in terms of demand so we are seeing a lot of demand uh, to Europe. Uh, my sense is by the time we end this summer, we would have a long haul travel would either match uh, or better the pre-COVID levels. At this point in time till last year, ah, we said long haul because of the visa delays and stuff like that had not fully recovered. All the other segments had recovered. But uh, long haul had not recovered. But my sense is with whatever we are seeing in terms of forwards, long haul will also recover. So Europe is very popular. Australia and New Zealand is extremely popular. We are seeing, uh, seeing a lot of demand from mature travelers to Kenya, South Africa, uh, Japan. Uh, Japan, the cherry blossom season is extremely popular. We are seeing people traveling. Yes. South Korea. So... You know, so overall, what what I'm saying is giving you a sense of how the summer looks like. Summer is going to be extremely busy. There will be supply side constraints like uh, airfares and the number of seats uh, capacity available. But then that's a good problem to have. Uh, they're not having uh, too much of demand. So right now, correct. And then there is the news of um, Indigo's uh, Indigo ordering wide body aircraft, which clearly shows that uh, you know the carrier has global aspirations right 
you know at this point in time between the two of the largest indian carriers the air india and the indigo both of them are practically taking a, a delivery of a new aircraft every week or 10 days so uh, mm -hmm. there is a huge demand up uh, so my sense is at some point in time they'll also start dominating because everybody is seeing uh, uh, that indians will continue to travel very very strong absolutely and uh, you know as as our aviation minister had said that he wants to be uh, he wants to make indian aviation hub yes you know um uh, vishal speaking about indian travelers it's clear that you know the indian travel landscape has of course changed significantly post covid you know there are more and more travelers what uh, you know when we are doing our stories when we are researching our stories we're finding that more and more travelers are coming from the smaller cities which we call tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 cities they are venturing out and like you mentioned it's thanks to increased connectivity and of course affordability as well you know the is the, the central government scheme of ude desh ka am nagrik you know the udan scheme which makes it uh, you know which is making uh, building airports in smaller cities and then there is the rising middle class in india which is you know and then coupled with the enthusiasm of the millennials and the gen g then c that is driving this uh, travel surge now these young travelers are eager to explore new destinations and seek uh, unique experiences and they want to make travel more accessible and inclusive than ever before what are your observations about the evolving in evolved or the evolving indian traveler see the indian travel uh, traveler has already come of age in my mind and uh, we've noticed and i'm just saying that and it's a combination of reasons why, why it's the growing affluence in the country obviously there is a mind shift change we are becoming a more spending economy and people are valuing experiences and travel over some of the material uh, acquisitions that they were earlier doing earlier it was a car which was very important today a trip to europe or maybe a trip outside of india is far more important i i have and very anecdotally speaking i have been interacting with some of the other ceos in other categories like apparels and lifestyle products and things like that and they've said uh, on record that uh, they are seeing some challenges within their categories because uh, the indian consumer is preferring travel and experiences over some of the other things like apparels and uh, some of these other lifestyle products so coming uh, back to the point we've noticed uh, in our uh, customer set a 10% drop in the average age of our traveler and that's uh, on account of two reasons one obviously for the reasons that we discussed earlier because it's an aspirational class uh, they are doing well they have disposable incomes and things like that it's also a combination of some of the things uh, some of the uh, access to uh, let's say products like uh, buy now pay later uh, because there are multiple fintech companies bank loans and uh, and people realize that they have easy emi options so the age of the traveler has come down plus we've also invested heavily uh because we we are a 75 year old organization as sotc uh we've been investing disproportionately in our digital assets to acquire customers digitally so we've noticed a a, a clear shift in the age profile of a traveler now this generation mm -hmm. is influenced uh, by the advent of uh, otts uh, they are mobile first so we we kind of enabled our content on their mobile devices so they can access us on their mobile devices they can call us up in a call centers or they can visit our stores and today we are present in close to about 50 odd cities and towns of india through our own offices and we we've left the convenience and the choice to the customer rather than we determining that we will only address them through online way uh we've said that you whatever is convenient to you you want to come to us online you want to call us in the call center or you want to visit our store we will allow you to do that so tier 2 and tier 3 cities with so much content now with the ott channels and there are so many travel channels and there is so much of information which is available people are using instagram and stuff like that and there is a different way of reaching out through their influencers and followers and we using all of these tools to reach out to this new new age traveler so and there is a lot of knowledge available per se plus what we have also done is for we've realized that india 
while it's a large country we have our regional nuances so uh, we have make our content available on our website through our regional platform so we have vernacular websites in multiple languages like uh, gujarati in bengali uh, and tamil the idea is to make sure that we can communicate uh, in their languages and that's helping us our tier 2 and tier 3 penetration we've created some regional sub brands with Uh, within our umbrella brand which is sotc for holidays we have regional brands like gurjar vishwadarshan which is essentially means for gujaratis you can see the world so that's a very gujarat specific with a gujarati speaking uh, tour manager uh, flights departing ex gujarat and obviously there is food uh, which is kind of one of the uh, key requirements from uh, people who travel from gujarat and things like that so we have regional specific so we have regionalized a lot of our programs like during durga puja we have uh, uh, very very specific propositions from east of india where durga puja mm-hmm. is big travel period so uh, so a combination of things in terms of the content availability in terms of regionalizing our content and to the availability of easy finance options and and the overall information and regional products i think that's where the tier 2 and tier 3 markets we are seeing uh, uh, about a 35% odd uh, uh, increase in the demand compared to previous years as far as the regional markets are concerned and we believe that they will be a big growth driver we have a clear focus in expanding the width uh, and the depth of our distribution across uh, the multiple cities and towns of india both physically as well as digitally uh, because we will continue to be an omni channel player for a foreseeable future so that's that's broadly where we are at this point in time then uh, there is obviously travel because it's an experiential product uh, this generation the younger generation likes to brag about it and they are Uh, looking at instagramable uh, destinations they are always on instagram they have friends and they're looking at likes and things like that you know a lot of these things are, are creating a positive momentum around uh, more demand at this point in time correct i think uh, uh, vishal you're very correct in saying that that while there is a great opportunity in travel in india but you also need to know how to tap that opportunity like you said like you mentioned that you know localizing experiences for travelers uh, you know it's very important for that and you talked about you know the vernacular websites that you have so that's the way in which you need to tap while there's a lot of opportunity but you need to know how to tap and yes of course you know social media is something that's really big i mean like it's instagram in india because tiktok is banned but elsewhere it might be tiktok a very interesting take on that uh shifting gears uh, you know i want to ask you about the recent weather event and its impact on travel the recent thunderstorms in uae have, at that time had undoubtedly affected travel plans for some you know flight and uh, fl- flights and activities uh, were disrupted but the resilient travel industry in the uae is of course working hard to ensure that there's minimal disruption and quick recovery i wanted to ask you something because india is definitely one of the biggest source markets for uae and for dubai specifically we are the biggest uh, source market for tourism are things back to normal uh, and do you have worried indian travelers uh, coming to you changing their plans yeah so uh, let's talk about what happened in uae one it was a short event uh, it was and obviously uh, no country or a city in this world can handle a downpour of this kind which suddenly happens correct and obviously there was a material disruption in the flight schedules and in terms of the customers but the whole disruption lasted for about 4 or 5 days in totality so it's a very short event mm-hmm. it came in we obviously had to reschedule a lot of our customers because a lot of customers who were already traveling they were in their overseas destinations so we had to reschedule their flights so we worked with the airline partners we worked with the hotel chains uh, to make sure that we reschedule their plans but at this point in time as we speak things are absolutely normal uh, emirates and uh, etihad airlines because uh, you must appreciate that uh, they are major hubs for all the westbound travel from india 
so mm-hmm. uh, there was a material disruption let me put it that way for those four or five days but things have been and they very quickly worked uh, and put the schedules back on track things are absolutely normal as we speak over the last three days odd uh, and as far as the customer is concerned i must tell you we are uh, our travelers are very very discerning they understand that these things happen they understand there is a disruption and there is some level of inconvenience that will happen but things are uh, very quickly back to normal and if you go on the ground in dubai i was talking to uh, some colleague who was in dubai two days back uh, things are absolutely normal on the road mother you don't even know uh, how materially the place was disrupted with water logging and all of those things at the airport and things are things are absolutely normal i must say that and the schedule so are the schedules and the backlogs have all been cleared yeah and then of course now with the uh, you know arabian travel mart ha- happening in dubai in the next uh, few weeks the half of india will be there right um thank you so much vishal for joining us today and for helping us cover a range of topics from visa changes to travel trends in india thanks bidden thanks for having me over and it was a pleasure interacting with you Yeah, it sure was. Uh, thank you for everyone tuning in. That wraps up today's uh, episode of the Skift India Travel Podcast. Remember to subscribe to the Skift India Podcast on your favorite listening app for more such discussions. And join us next time for more exciting insights and updates from the world of travel. Thank you very much. This has been the Skift India Travel Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.